and welcome to Cultural Capital. And now it's finally December, which means at last we're allowed to talk about Christmas. This week we're getting thoroughly festive at the Troxy in Limehouse, where they're going all out with that Christmas movie magic. And we pay a visit to an exhibition that takes joy in the small things at Flowers Gallery in Mayfair. We're investigating invertebrates at the Grant Museum for Thing of the Week, and I'll be reviewing a pitch black Christmas comedy that could reasonably be described as the perfect opposite to a Richard Curtis movie. First though, the Art Deco's Troxy Cinema in Limehouse is always gorgeous, but this season the experiential cinema specialist's Backyard Cinema have taken things up a notch and transformed it into a Christmas movie palace with special screenings, a live choir and an original story written and presented by George the Poet. We, of course, were there with Jingle Bells on. Back Your Cinema has transformed to, uh, we're doing a, a, a live show where we're trying to uh, add live elements with one of your classic favourite Christmas films. So we know everybody loves to watch Elf, Home Alone, Love Actually, so how can we make that bigger, better? How can we make the watching the movie at home bigger and better? So we've added a Christmas live choir, we've created a bespoke poem and story with George the Poet, um, and we've put it on an enormous screen in an enormous venue with loads of decorations. So it should feel like the cr most Christmassy way to watch Elf or Home Alone ever. My apologies are hard to spit out, even if just for the sake of peace. It's exciting being down here at the Troxy, man. I can see all of these seats, I can see the atmosphere, and I know what, what a treat everyone's in for. I'm like a narrator. I just want to hold the audience's hand and walk them through some Christmas memories that I think are pretty universal. 2020 was a crazy year. Well, the star of my Christmas story is the Christmas movie, right? The Christmas movie is something that brings families together. It provides, like, you know, the, something to return to. So we've tried to incorporate nostalgia into all parts of the event. So not only have we got retro trailers beforehand for you from the Christmas period, but the song choices, the film choices, even the way that we've dressed the choir, even the set design is designed to induce a nostalgia. And then George's bespoke poem really dives into it on a slightly deeper level as well. So there's loads of layers there. I hope audiences will find themselves in the story. Um, I hope they'll have uh, a good time and they'll, div they'll have a sense of perspective and a sense of, you know, uh, growth and appreciation. It feels um, like a real reward to be able to have a proper Christmas this year. Backyard Cinema Christmas Movie Spectacular is at the Troxy until the end of the month. Now, for a show that has quietly become an old favourite of the festive season. Small is Beautiful is a long-running group exhibition at Flowers Gallery. This will be its 39th edition, in which a selection of contemporary artists working in any media are invited to present any kind of work, but very, very small. We tiptoed in for a look. The first exhibition of Small Does Beautiful was in 1974. This show has evolved and evolved. This year we've got 113 artists and actually having a physical show after COVID has been so lovely because it's sort of, it's a show for the artists as well as for the gallery and for the collectors. They all come in together, they all get to exhibit together when they're not nat natural companions. Um, so it's a very beautiful show to see come to life. I don't usually work at this scale. Most of my work is sort of led by found objects or abandoned spaces. Whatever that, that thing is, is what leads the piece. So I work a lot on found windows. Um, so they're sort of like this size. So then to be invited to do this, it was, um, it was actually really nice because my work's really physically demanding. So I could just sit uh, at a desk very quietly <laughs> and just work with small paintbrushes and, and working on something really small is actually sort of, yeah, it's like quite calming for me. It's almost like you have to focus that really tightly in and be much more considered. When you're making a mark with paint, it feels more important when it's on a smaller scale because it's going to be more noticeable. You can't just be like flinging paint around. It, I found it quite restrictive, but in an interesting sort of way. It's got more intense and restrictive. 
In terms of materials, we've got ceramicists, we've got artists working in neon, we've got oil paintings, prints, woodcuts. I think that this year is probably one of the most diverse in terms of mediums. A lovely example is Nicola Hicks's piece here, which is a maquette for her child scarer. So that piece is part of her large exhibition in Kingsland Road, The Jump Circus, and she specifically made it on a tiny scale for Small is Beautiful. But to see a plaster next to a beautiful oil on canvas, next to this piece by Jane Ellen, which is the articulated sculpture. It's such a contrast. We want people to come in to enjoy themselves and to really explore and learn about new artists. Some of the pieces in this show are 12,000 pounds. Some of the pieces in this show are 150 pounds. Some of the artists have just graduated whereas some are very established, it should be a really welcoming, accessible exhibition. Small is Beautiful is on until the 8th of January. Now, it's Thing of the Week. This is a beautiful wax model of three sea anemones that was made by French maker specialising in natural history models, Maison Tremond. The model is made from different coloured wax and put on some limestone. Um, it's part of a very rare collection that we have here at the Grant Museum. It's believed that these were made in the early part of the 19th century by Tremond, and none of the catalogues that they produced of various teaching models that they were making during that time include the sea anemones or some of the malacological or shell oyster models that we have also in the collection. Um, so therefore, we believe that they were special order. The reason why they were made is to produce a lifelike representation of a soft-bodied organism. So sea anemones, if you try to pickle them in jars, they lose their shape and their colour. So a lot of these models were created to show what the animal would have looked like in life. And they're very beautiful and accurate. There's no doubt that this week's film is a Christmas movie. There's a tree, there's the roast dinner, it even has Keira Knightley. But if you're more of the Netflix algorithm festive romance persuasion, this new British comedy is probably not what you're after. Silent Night is dark. Really, really dark. You look perfect. Fly! Oh, did you bleed on the carrots? Will I die? Yep, probably. A group of posh school friends are gathering for Christmas with their families at a country house where Nell, played by Knightley, and Simon, a perfect Matthew Good, are hosting the holiday with their three sons. Jesus, they're early. As their pals start to arrive with kids and girlfriends in tow, it becomes clear that this isn't a normal Christmas. In fact, it appears likely to be humanity's last. The planet is angry, explains Nell's eldest son, Art, played brilliantly by Roman Griffin Davis, who you might remember from Jojo Rabbit, and it's sending a poison gas to eliminate us. The government has initiated a Die With Dignity campaign, issuing individual suicide capsules to all legal citizens, which, to Art's heated indignation, does not include the homeless or illegal immigrants. Happy Christmas. You're still alive? Yes, I think so. Simon robbed the petrol station. Oh, what fun. Having opened the presents and spent their children's now pointless college funds on shoes, this band of boozy, sarky mates, including, among others, Lucy Punch and Chopé Durisou, alongside Lily Rose Depp as his earnest American girlfriend, are in the position of having to end their own lives and those of their most precious loved ones but only after a massive festive piss-up, obviously. It's the writer-director Camille Griffin's first feature. Art and his on-screen brothers are her sons in real life, and it was inspired, she says, by the inevitable failure of parenting, trying to do better by them and never quite managing it. The film isn't perfect by any means, but I do love her astute capturing of that very British instinct to undermine fear and difficult emotions with pitch-black humour. It's also a gloriously awful portrait of highly privileged people being amusingly ghastly while benignly neglecting their kids. They, by the way, have been given special dispensation to swear as much as they like, this being their last night on earth. Art, who is quite rightly enraged by the situation in which he finds himself, swears a lot. 
Griffin rings quite a lot out of a simple premise, touching lightly here and there on some very big themes, but never very long. There is a tiny moment, for example, in the middle of a truth-telling conversation that explores the impact of sexual abuse, not just on the victim, but also the people around them, how inadequately they respond because they don't know how to. And it's momentarily so sad. And then the conversation moves on in the way that people do, because they have to. This is a very funny, very British, very cosy comedy with an absolutely horrifying twist. I enjoyed it immensely, and then I left, and I felt completely discombobulated for quite a long time afterwards. Actually, perhaps disturbed is a better word. This is a genuinely disturbing film. The ethical decision at the centre of it is impossible to make. And that's before you consider the alarming parallels that even Griffin wasn't expecting when the film was made. It's an assured first feature for her, and it's one hell of a sharpener. Silent Night is in cinemas now. Thanks for watching Cultural Capital. Assuming the planet lets us live that long, I'll see you next week. <laughs>